Good morning. Good to see you all here today. Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Job said, if I have put my trust in money, that is, if my happiness depends on wealth, it would mean that I denied the God of heaven. Isaiah says, why spend money on what does not satisfy? I want to begin this question. You already know what the topic is. When I say the word money, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? First thing? Wealth. Wealth. Okay. What's the first word? That's another word. Bills. Bills, of course. Bills. Power. Power. Security. Taxes. Taxes. Anxiety. Anxiety, of course. When you think of money. Debt. Debt. Okay? Debt. Anyone else? When you think of money, what's the word that comes to your mind? Vacation. Vacation from the cold that costs lots of money. Never enough. Never enough. Why is, it, why is it that the hair goes up on the back of our necks when the minister announces that we're going to talk about money? Why is it that for some people, whether you're doing it outwardly or inwardly, there's this? <laughs> posture that, that you want to adapt. Oh. It's this series again. For those of you who are going to your happy place, we'll see you at Easter. Or at least the next series. Money is a spiritual thing. And we're talking this whole year, we're looking at the measure of our spirituality, that we are called to live a spiritual life, to live the life of the Spirit. And we're looking at the marks and the measures of what it means to truly be spiritual, to understand what it means to walk in the Spirit, and to understand uh, how we know that we really are. What are the marks and the measures of true spirituality as we understand a, a, a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ? We, we enter into this, what we sometimes in the church will call a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We, we give our lives over to Him. And Sometimes the church refers to that as the born-again spirits. And you enter into this born-again experience. You, you acknowledge that uh, God gave his son uh, so much because he loves us. His son went to the cross, died, rose again. We're beginning Lent starts uh, uh, real soon. We're moving towards Easter. We enter into this personal relationship with him. And when we do so... We say words like, Lord, I surrender my life to you. I'm going to live my life to you. You can take my life, Lord. It's all yours. I surrender my life over to you. And much like a marriage covenant, much like a marriage vow where you say to uh, your spouse, as you did on that wedding day, for better, for worse, for rich or poor, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, I give myself to you forever. You enter into a personal relationship with them that says, I am no longer mine. My body is not mine. My finance is not mine. My, my life, my, my everything, my all is not my own. My life is now surrendered to you, and she does the same thing. And when we enter into this personal relationship with Jesus, we, we don't quite somehow see the two as synonymous. Even though Paul gave us marriage so that we would understand the relationship between Christ and the church, we often sometimes think that our relationship, our personal relationship with him, is kind of outside those kinds of bonds or restrictions, if you would. Lord, come into my life. I am yours. Be my Lord, my Savior, and King. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my eternity. I trust you with my today. I trust you with my... I trust you with my... We can't even say it. I trust you with my money. 
We give our lives to him and we set off a chain of events, whether we acknowledge it or not. But in we, when we enter into that personal relationship, we say, God, my life is surrendered to you. And God says, okay, I'll take you up on that. Come, Lord Jesus, be my savior and king. Okay, I will, thank you very much. Lord, my whole life is yours. Okay, I'll take it. You didn't know you signed up that way, did you? But that's what it is. See, God's not a renter. God's an owner. And when you gave him your life, you gave him all of it or none of it. But he doesn't share it, not even with you. And so we have this challenge, if you would, because money's an important thing. We're going to discover over the next three weeks just how important it is. Money matters. How we handle finances is such a, a hotly contested, uh, debated, kind of argued topic in and out of the church, and, and we don't want to talk about it. It's like the elephant in the room. We don't want to talk about it because it weighs us, doesn't it? It measures us. It shows us who and what we are truly trusting in and what we are relying on, what are we looking to. It is one of the greatest measures of our spirituality. You say you're spiritual, you say you love God, you say you're surrendered to him, show me the money. Show me the money. Show me how you make it. Show me how you've earned it, how you spend it, how you save it, how you share it. Show me what you do with it. And I'll show you how spiritual you really are. Oh, Preacher, move on. Shut up. I will in three weeks. Not how much of it you have. See, that's not the thing today. See, that's where we're going to. Uh, we immediately jump to that. It's not how much you have, folks. It's how much of it has you. That's what we're going to find out. We need to talk about it because it matters. You know the Bible speaks about money more than it does any other topic in all of the New Testament? So those of you who are new to faith, do you know that the Bible speaks more about money than it does about heaven or hell or salvation or grace or redemption or even the cross? 613 times Jesus and the apostles spoke about money. There are more stories related to wealth and money that Jesus talked on than any other topic Jesus ever spoke about. Money matters. It matters to you and I because we need it. It matters to God because he is the one who gives it. It matters to the enemy of your soul because he wants to use it to destroy your lives and your future. And as statistics would indicate, he's doing a pretty good job. We'll talk more about that next week. You know, it's a funny thing. In our country, we become quite accustomed to warning labels. I mean, there's, there's hardly anything that doesn't have a caution of some sort as to either the side effects or the misuse of, of a certain thing. And some of it may be scare tactics of what might happen to you if you do. If you go to the gas station, you're going to gas up your car, they'll tell you, you know, you can't smoke within nine meters. You know, you're not supposed to use your cell phone. You have to shut your engine off. Um, you know, if you, you know, there's all these warning labels on smoking uh, packs of cigarettes and all these ugly pictures that are supposed to scare you. Uh, diet, soft drinks, seat belts. There's all these warnings now on seat belts and the proper use and airbags. And, and, and uh, you know, I, uh, I always think the funniest one is these TV, television, drug commercials. You watch this drug commercial, and in three minutes, it tells you how this drug is going to change your life. Then it goes on for 75 seconds and talks about all the miserable, grisly, painfully torturous ways that you will suffer and die a horrible death. But just take our drug, because we can improve your life. Your Timmy's this morning even has a warning label on it that says, you are about to consume, here's a no-brainer, you're about to consume a hot liquid. <laughs> and if you're not careful, you may scald yourself. Oh, I know, I think what I'll do is I'll take the lid off and I'll pour it all over my face and just see. <laughs> uh, I've been studying this. If, you know our money has all different colors? I'm partial to brown. Now, I'm only partial to brown because I don't know what color comes after brown. Does anybody know what comes after brown? Purple? 
I would love for somebody to introduce me to the color purple. If you have any purple lying around and you'd like to share or show your pastor, I'd love to see some purple. I've never seen purple before, but, but I, I've been looking at this brown because this is as much as I have, and I've been looking at this brown note. Um, I really miss paper. I hate this plastic garbage. But, um, and everywhere I look, you know what's missing? There's no warning labels. I mean, if it is so important... And if it at times can be so dangerous in the wrong hands and used in the wrong way, why are there no warning labels on this? There's just pictures and some colors and some, some things. And then, you know, the other thing besides that, there's this other thing that I've got in my pocket here, and I've been looking at it as well, and it's, it's this thing, it's a credit card. And, you know, I've looked at it. I've looked at the front. I've looked at the back. And there are no warning labels on this. We know that it is very, very dangerous. In fact, I would suggest to you that this credit card is as dangerous as a pack of cigarettes. So if we've got ugly pictures on the cigarettes, how come we don't have ugly pictures on a credit card? How come there are no warning labels that the misuse of this is going to absolutely destroy your life? When I look at this credit card, the only thing that it tells me is that I'm not the owner. Did you know that? You don't own this. I'm told when I read this that this is the property of the CIBC. The bank owns this. Now, the only thing that I find incredible about that is is if the bank owns this, how come the bill at the end of the month has my name on it? (laughs) What's with that? If the bank wants to own the card, how come they don't get to own the piece of paper that comes in the mail? Put their name on it. They own the card, but I own the bill. That's not a good deal. The way we handle our money as Christians is one of the greatest indicators and markers of our spiritual maturity and submission to honoring Christ. James Moffat said that a man's treatment of money is the most decisive test of his own character, how he makes it and how he spends it. And we are touchy when it comes to discussing money as a measurement of our spirituality. And the reason why I think we are so touchy about it, the reason why this causes us to adapt such a difficult posture is because it's really a question of ownership. And when I mean ownership, there's one big challenge. We think it's ours. We think it's ours. And there's nothing more frustrating for the Christian to think that the money that they have belongs to them. In fact, I would suggest to you that if you're frustrated in your spirituality, if you find yourself stagnant, if you find yourself not growing, if you find yourself frustrated, it isn't about prayer, it isn't about reading your Bible, it isn't about all those other actions that we think are supposed to make us more spiritual. I would suggest to you that one of the greatest challenges to your spiritual health is money. Turn to somebody and say, hang on, you need to hear this. I don't need to hear this, but you need to hear this. We think it's ours. I mean, and why wouldn't we? Whose name is on the check? Us. When you sign a check, whose name do you write? Hopefully your own. (laughs) The bank accounts have our name on it. Go to your glove compartment on your way home, check out the ownership. Your name is on the ownership of the car. Your name is on the house deed. If everything has my name on it, then it must be mine, right? And we we as Christians, we make it even more spiritual. Thank you, God, that I have this great job. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you have, that I have uh, these wonderful gifts and skills and talents and abilities. And yes, I know that you've given them to me, but thank you that I do such a great job with those gifts, skills, and abilities. Thank you, Lord, that I have a great work ethic, that I'm not like all those other lazy bums that need to go out and get a job. Thank you, O Lord, that I know how to work and put in a hard day's effort. Thank you, O Lord, that I know how to save my money, that I know how to be a good, a good uh, steward with my finances, that I know how to save, I know how to invest, I know how to work hard. Thank you that I am so great, Lord. We are wise in our own eyes, aren't we? Allow me to illustrate. When my girls were little, I would love to take them out for a date, the daddy-daughter date. And I would take them to various places for a bit of a date. And, and over the years, those dates have changed. I would take my Ashley, I would take her to McDonald's. 
and we would have French fries and chicken McNuggets. I take her out now, but it costs me more browns. <laughs> now when I ask her, where do you want to go? She says to me, the keg. <laughs> Taking my daughter out on a date doesn't happen quite as often because it's a little bit more costly. But when she was three or four years old, on a Saturday morning, I would take her to McDonald's and, and I would treat her with chicken nuggets and french fries, and there we would sit there, and we would laugh and talk and joke, and we would have lots of fun. And I will never forget one of those very first times when I reached over and I took a couple of those french fries, and as I reached over, she had this absolute look of horror on her face as she grabbed that little satchel of small fries, pulled them close up against her coat, and said, no, daddy, those are my fries. Get your own. And it was at that moment that I realized that I needed to teach that precious little princess a few lessons about ownership. And I would suggest that the same lessons apply to us with God. You see, she didn't understand that as her father, I am the source of all that she has and receives in her life. As her father, I am the, the source of those fries. Those fries are mine. I don't need to get my own. I have fries. I just got finished buying them. By then, they were 25 cents. I bought her that bag of fries with my money. She did not understand that I was the source of her fries, not her. She also did not understand that I had all of the right, all of the power, and all of the authority to take any of what she has, including her fries. No manager would have stopped me if I had reached over and grabbed that bag of fries and said, you know what, I'm going to eat them all myself. Now, she might have cried, I would have looked like a mean daddy, but they were within my right to do so. Furthermore, I could have taken those fries and I could have thrown them into the garbage and said, you don't get to have any fries now because of that. And even better, what I could have done was I could have taken those fries, gone to another table with another family sitting there and looked to that little girl and say, honey, you can have my fries because we're going to teach this little girl some lessons. <laughs> you know what I'm getting at, don't you? Are you with me? She didn't understand that all right power and authority was mine to give her more than she could possibly contain. You see, I could have pulled out one of those browns. I didn't have any back then, but if I'd had a brown, I could have pulled one of those out, gone to the girl at the counter and said, you see that little princess over there? Bury her in fries. Smother her. I could have absolutely had a truckload of fries and covered her so you'd only see the top of her hair. She didn't understand that I don't need her fries. I mean, look at me. Of course I don't need her fries. When was the last time this needed fries? <laughs> she didn't understand that it's not about the fries. She didn't understand that I could care less about the fries. I cared about her heart. I cared about her life. And the most important thing of the morning was not the fries. It was not the chicken and nuggets. The most important thing was her and I being together. I didn't care about the fries. I cared about being with her. The reason why I took in the resources and purchased the fries and gave her to in the first place was so that her and I could be together. Could it be that the Father and everything that he has provided in your life is not for the sake of rather giving it to you, but rather he wants to spend some time with you? And if it means fries, so be it. I'll use fries. Are you okay? See, the fries are dad's gift to her. What she does with those fries was her gift back to dad. So what keeps us from trusting God? What keeps us from his ownership in our lives and our acknowledgement of his ownership? Well, greed. I think greed has a big thing to do with it. No, nobody wants to admit that they're greedy. 
But there's this idea that we're always supposed to be having more, always supposed to be getting more, that we're never satisfied with what God has provided for us. And because we're not satisfied, we're always having to go get more. Our culture tells us that. Our world teaches us that. You have a house, you get a bigger house. You get a bigger house, you get a better house. You have a car, you get a bigger car. You get a better car, you get more cars. You get two cars, you get three cars. You have clothes, you buy more clothes. You get more clothes because you need more clothes. You don't need more clothes, but you get more clothes. I just came back from the Dominican and I, I was in a, a, a little girl's home and, and the entire home, I am not exaggerating, the, the entire home was as big as this, just this little wooden platform. The whole home. And there were two single cots and on the one cot, five children sleep. On the other cot, a mother sleeps. And at the head of the cot was the hot burner for the food. There was no fridge. There was only one light bulb. And there was no washroom. They all shared a common hole in the ground 20 feet away with no running or flushing water. And as Cheryl and I spent the afternoon with this mother and these children, and, and we did, we spent all afternoon just sitting in her home talking with her and hearing her stories. I'm reminded that the need to always want more is, a, is something that keeps us from learning how to truly trust God. I think we have a problem with God and his ownership because we're lazy. Again, no one would say, what do you say I'm lazy? I'm not lazy, I work hard for what I have. I know you work hard for it. But we get lazy about the way in which we earn it sometimes and we try to do it the easier way. We get afraid that we're not going to have enough, and so we try to come up with ways in which we can get it easier, faster, quicker. Pride gets in the way. We measure ourselves against others, and we look, at the, we look at how people have more fries than we have fries, and we say, that's not right. Why should you have more than me? I mean, why would God bless you more than me? It's not right that he has given more to you. Why would I trust you as the owner and me as just the steward if you're giving them more than you've given to me? That's not right. Why would I ever trust you? Why, are you saying they're better than me? Now, I know you never do that. Fear. What if he doesn't come through? I've got to take measures into my own hands. I've got to control this thing. I, I've got to take ownership of this because if I don't take ownership, what if God does not come through and does not provide? Of course, presumption, entitlement. We, we think that we're the reason for our own existence. That's not true. You're not the reason for your existence. We're not all here because of you. God is not here because of you. You're here because of him. He's the center, not us. You see, you're asking the wrong question. If you're saying, can I trust God? You're asking the wrong question. The question is not, can we trust God? The question is, can God trust us? God knows he's trustworthy. The only caveat is whether or not we're trustworthy. And that's measured in stewardship. Am I the owner or the manager? Because that's the true measure of spirituality. When, it looks, when you look at your resource, talent, gifts, skills, money, ability, time, possessions, your energies, your wallet, everything, are you the owner or are you the manager? You see, if you're the owner, then everything is about power. Everything is about control. Who is in control? You see, if, if you're the manager, then everything is about submission. And you see, this is, this is, again, I'm telling you, this is the source of the frustration. Because if you are the owner, then you're the one who's in control. And the problem with being in control is that what happens if you don't do it right? And that's why we have anxiety and heart attacks. And that's why we have marriages failing and, and children who are neglected. That's why we have people that are working 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 hours a week. That's why we have holding down two and three jobs. And that's why we're, we're out of control of their spending. Because we're the owner. And because we're the owner, we're in control. And because we're in control and we don't do it right we got to turn the nut. But if God's the owner and we're in submission to him, then it's, there's no more worry. If you have anxiety about your finances and your resources, if there's anxiety in your life about your possessions and where you are at financially, economically, or, or in this sphere of possessions today, if you have anxiety with it today, I'll tell you right now, the source is you're the owner. 
Amen? Oh, we'll need to get some music going here soon to make everybody feel better. You see, if I'm the owner, then the issue is pride, but if I'm the manager, the issue is thankfulness, true thankfulness. Nothing I have, nothing I have is mine. Because I didn't earn this. I didn't earn this. I just showed up and God was faithful. Am I building my kingdom or God's kingdom? You see, that's, that's, that's the challenge we have right now because in this world, especially for boomers, anybody who's, who's 50 years of age and up, we have this big thing going on boomers. Remember that first lie that was sold to us about 25 years ago? <laughs> Those of you who are younger, you never even heard this before, but there was this thing that pervaded. Do you remember this thing they called Freedom 55? <laughs> and they sold us this lie right from the pit of hell. It was, it was a lie. They were all in cahoots. That if you just invest their way, do their thing, follow their plan, listen to their map, by the time you hit 55 years of age, you can have a double wide trailer paid for in Boca Raton, Florida. You can pay for your house and you can live any way the heck you please and it doesn't really matter. And now they're telling us we're going to work to 73 if we're lucky and won't even pay for our house. I don't know if there's enough Walmarts out there to keep all of us seven-year-olds in, in jobs. I don't know. I've just been, I've been wondering that. It's a, I'm hoping that they'll take me to a golf course, but... but See, what's the measure? How do you know? I do that, and it's not, I'm not saying, I'm, we're going to be talking about investment, so don't get me wrong. But how do we know? I mean, the catch word right now is legacy. We've got to leave a legacy, got to leave a legacy, got to leave a legacy. A legacy of what? I'm not saying that we shouldn't leave a legacy, but what does that mean? How do you know at the end of the day that you've won? How will you know as a Christian at the end of the day if you got this thing Right? Because your house was paid for? Because you left a bunch of money for your kids so that you can destroy their lives because they don't know what to do with it either? Is that, the, is that how you're going to know? Because you, you give them a dump load of money that they never earned or worked for? Are you going to measure whether you got this right because you got the nursing home of your choice? Whenever we sit down with our girls and talk about their future and finances and how we're caring for them and, and what we're doing for them, they'll, they'll kind of wink at me and Ashley will often say she's going through law school right now and she'll say, well, Dad, do you want a good nursing home or an okay nursing home? <laughs> Little princess needs a few more lessons. <laughs> <laughs> how do you know? Are you going to live life as a reservoir or as a river? You see, if, a res if a, you're living your life as a reservoir, then the goal is to how deep can you get it? It's a simple measure. It's mathematics. He who has the deepest pond wins. So you measure success against the depth of your pond. But here's, here's a challenge. What if we got it all wrong? What if at the end of the day, the measure of success is not the depth of your pond, but the amount of volume that has flown through your hands? What if instead of living as a reservoir, we're called to live as a river? And so rather than the depth of the pond, it's about how much has gone through. How much has flown through your life? How about coming to the end of a year and not saying, how much did I make and how much did I spend and what's left over? Rather, how much did I gave away? It's a mindset. Pleasing self or pleasing others? Watch Who am I watching or who's watching me? All of these things. The Bible says that the way you handle your money determines how much God can bless your life. If you don't manage your money well, if you're not responsible for your finances, the Bible says that God can't trust you with true spiritual blessings. We've already read that. Your handout has a story of Luke in Luke chapter 16. I'm not going to read it. I leave that for you just to look at it on your own. David wanted to build a temple for God. He wanted to build a massive temple. He wanted to glorify God. He was so grateful to God and thankful for God's provision. God said to David, you can't build the temple. There's blood in your hands. And so he said to your son, 
Solomon, your Solomon is going to build the temple, and the temple is going to be amazing. And through your son, I will make your name famous. Through your son, your, your lordship, your kingship will last forever and ever and ever. And so David, finding out that he's not able to build the temple, he begins to lay out the plans and the schematics for the temple of God, the Solomon's temple, which to this day is still recognized as one of the greatest edifices ever created by mankind. And the Bible says that because David was not allowed to build the temple, he gave the plans to his son, and then David went into the king's reserves. That is, he went into his own bank account. The Bible says that David pulled out gold and silver and gave it to his son and said, take this gold. Interesting thing about it is, is that they say that the amount of gold that David pulled out in today's value is worth the billions. Billions, that's with a B was fabulous wealth. And he gave it all for the temple of God. And in that moment, in that time, David gathers the people around and they're, they're just so grateful for what God has done in their lives. And David prays this prayer. And with this, I want you to just to contemplate. David prays the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. And he says this, praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, for you are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor, they come from you, for you are the ruler of all things, and in your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to any and to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and we praise your glorious name. For who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this because everything comes for you from you and we have only given you what first comes from your hand. They gave freely without reservation and with joy because they knew they weren't the owner. They weren't giving God anything that wasn't already his. And they gave without any kind of reluctance, no hold back. There was no, because there was complete trust. When it comes to giving, folks, whenever there's this moment of going, if I'm not going to have enough, that's trust. We'd like to call it, spiritualize it and call it wisdom. Well, I want to be wise. Not when it comes to God. When it comes to God, it's trust. Trust. Wisdom, true wisdom says it's not mine. So whatever you say, God. They gave without reservation. They gave without reluctance. And they gave without any regret. No regret. They knew they couldn't get out give God. They knew it wasn't theirs. They knew their trust was in him. Silly people, we trust and think London Hydro cares about whether or not we're warm. Sorry, I always pick on London Hydro. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Jeff. We think they want to keep us warm. They don't care about keeping us warm. Don't pay them for a while and find out how much they care about your warmth. They don't care. Your boss? Your boss cares for you? The most you can expect is a $50 thing of flowers, two to four, seven to nine of your visitation. That's about all you'll get. Maybe a handshake to your spouse. You think the bank cares about you? You think you can trust the bank when the bank says, don't worry, we'll take care of it. Don't worry, we'll make this, we'll work this out. We'll work this out. Yeah, well, you don't, go, don't pay them for three months and just see how much they're gonna work this out with you. They'll foreclose on you so fast. Who are you trusting in? I'd rather trust in the God who's the owner, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that all that is was made and fashioned by his hand. That's who I choose to trust in. And there's no regret. There is no regret when you give in God's economy. When you give by faith. You go, you know what? I don't care. 
none of his mind anyways. I'm only here for one thing, to grow and mature into the full stature of the reflection of Jesus Christ. That's the goal. That's the end run. That's the measure at the end of the day. Not how much you have. The legacy. The legacy. He was a man of God. He was a woman of God. Or she was a woman of God who loved with all of her heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the measure. That's the legacy. I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes, bow your heads, just listen to this song. Just, my, my, at the end, my only goal for today is, uh, you know what, next week we're going to get real practical. We're going to talk about debt. We're going to give you some tools. We've got a course that's starting up. I invite you to take part of that. We're going to talk in two weeks about investment and and, and, and the need for investment. And we're gonna talk about all those practical wise things that are good and right. Don't get me wrong, they're good and right and we'll talk about those, but you, you don't get to go to that until you deal with ownership. None of that helps. That's just a Band-Aid if you don't settle ownership. If you don't settle stewardship, you don't get the other stuff. It's just gonna be frustrating. So at the end of the day, I just want you to take a few moments and ask yourself, are your eyes bigger than your fries? Father, lead us and guide us. Speak to us by your spirit. Whatever it is you're saying, Lord, we're listening. There's a powerful truth in that song. Sometimes we are tempted to think that there's a lot of things that we need. It's natural, isn't it? If I asked every one of you to write out a list of all the things that you need, if you're anything like me, it would probably be a pretty long list. But if we can take hold of the truth that Jesus can be all in all to us, as that old hymn said, and that he is meant to be the sufficiency of God, that means more than enough. And that in him, we find all that we ever need. Spiritually, physically, financially, relationally. And we can experience the fullness of God in Christ. If we can, if we can take hold of that and let it go into our hearts, I believe that it could revolutionize who we are and the way we live. He is all that you need. In him, you find your source. He owns and holds everything in the universe, including us. Before we leave today, will you stand with me? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you today that you are everything we need. I thank you today, Lord, that you are the owner. We think sometimes that we are, but Lord, we're not. Lord, the scripture says that not only do you own and that you made everything, but that we are your people and therefore we belong to you. We're your chosen people, your spiritual family. So Lord, today, help us in an act of surrender, Lord, to give ourselves all we are, all we have, all we've been entrusted with to you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice leading us as to what to do with who we are and with what we have so that you can make us more like you, Jesus. That's our desire. And Lord, in, in spite of the touchiness of this subject, Lord, I pray that you would help our hearts to be soft and open and that, Lord, throughout this week, you will help us, Lord, to take steps towards following you in this way. We acknowledge to you today, Lord, 
You are all we need. Thank you, O God, and I pray you'll lead your people this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Be blessed today, and we'll see you soon.